Biden meets with the Prime Minister of Japan as he first arrives in Japan for the G7. On Thursday, President Joe Biden touched down in Japan as part of a brief trip to Asia and tended to support friends in the face of China's expanding military and economic aspirations. Biden will make an effort to bring together the heads of some of the biggest economies in the world behind a pledge to confront Beijing's aggressions. When it comes to matters like Taiwan, the South China Sea, and Beijing's oppressive economic policies, the president values cooperation and favors a unified front. I think you will see, coming out of this summit, alignment and convergence around the fundamental principles of our approach to the People's Republic of China, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan told reporters aboard Air Force One as Biden flew to Japan. Of course, each country has its own distinct relationship and its own distinct approach, but those relationships and approaches are built on a common basis. And I think you will see that reflected in the outcomes of the G7. As soon as he lands, Joe Biden will meet with Fumio Kishida, the Prime Minister of Japan. In response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and China's increasing military aggressiveness, the summit's host nation has strengthened its foreign policy, a move that has been warmly received by the White House. In response to mounting threats from regional competitors, especially China, Kushida launched a new national security strategy in December that amounted to the nation's largest military expansion since World War II, tripling the defense budget and departing from its pacifist constitution. The choice signaled a significant shift for the country as well as the U.S. security coalition in the Indo-Pacific region. With threats coming from North Korea, Iran, and Russia, none of which have a clear resolution, there are growing nuclear security concerns at the time of this week's meeting. Joe Biden's trip, which was originally scheduled to last eight days, has been cut in half, Two of Biden's three destinations have been eliminated so that he may return to Washington for discussions on lifting the U.S. debt ceiling. As additional Russian sanctions are being prepared by the G7, Zelensky is anticipated to attend the Japan meeting. As they get ready to meet with Volodymyr Zelensky this weekend, who officials said was planning a dramatic trip to Japan as he continues to appeal for military support amid Russia's invasion, U.S. President Joe Biden and other world leaders unveiled tough new sanctions on Russia. The latest restrictions are meant to close gaps and target underutilized industries as Western officials continue to work towards stifling Moscow's ability to fund conflicts. As Ukrainian soldiers get ready for a counteroffensive, authorities were anticipated to discuss the situation often. The U.S. will increase its sanctions powers and impose additional designations across Europe, the Middle East, and Asia to more specifically target Russia's economy. As part of its most recent sanctions on Moscow, the U.K. stated it will prohibit the purchase of Russian diamonds, Downing Street said on Friday. The action attempts to curtail one of Russia's few surviving export sectors, which had mostly escaped the already severe Western sanctions. According to UK regulations that will be implemented later this year, imports of copper, aluminum, and nickel with a Russian provenance will also be prohibited. Amid a potential U.S. debt default, which his advisers warned may undermine U.S. leadership and destabilize the global economy, Biden meets with other foreign leaders on Friday in Japan. 
The risk seems more pressing as Biden tries to persuade other G7 leaders to support a unified stance toward China and Russia. The group is anticipated to announce further sanctions against Moscow on the first day of the summit meetings as a reaction to the invasion of Ukraine that depends on the stability of the American financial system. It is unclear how much the debt stalemate would come up in Biden's meetings in Hiroshima, but several European officials said that they had traveled a similar path in the past when American leaders sought to prevent financial catastrophe only to find a solution at the 11th hour. As talks to raise the U.S. borrowing ceiling continue in advance of June 1, the earliest day by which the U.S. can run out of money to pay its obligations, Biden cut short his trip to Asia and flew back to Washington. The person cited a sanctions regime on Russia that depends on the stability of the U.S. financial system and saying that even the possibility of default has the capacity to reduce American diplomatic influence. That is never more obvious than in Russia's continuing conflict in Ukraine. This Friday, the war will be a major topic of discussion for world leaders. Moscow expelled 500 Americans, including journalists. According to a statement from Russia's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the government declared it was prohibiting 500 Americans, including several important members of U.S. executive power, from entering as a response to the regularly anti-Russian sanctions imposed by the Joe Biden administration. Obama, John Huntsman, a former U.S. ambassador, many U.S. senators, and Charles Q. Brown Jr., who would likely succeed Obama as chairman of the Joint Chiefs, are all on the list. American late-night TV hosts Jimmy Kimmel, Colbert, and Seth Meyers are also on a long list of names. In addition, the statement stated, the attached list 500 also includes those in government and law enforcement agencies who are directly involved in the persecution of dissidents in the wake of the so-called storming the capital. A few months later, Russian President Vladimir Putin seemed to dispute the detention of the protesters, claiming that the crowd had gone to Congress with political demands, according to Reuters. In a statement posted on its website, the ministry defended the restrictions, saying, it is high time for Washington to learn that not a single hostile attack against Russia will go without a strong reaction. The charges against each individual were not specified, and it was not made clear what the consequences would entail beyond an exclusion from the county. Additionally, the ministry stated that it is still refusing American journalist Evan Gershkovich's request for consular access from the U.S. Embassy, due to the failure to issue visas to Russian journalists from the Lavrov pool an apparent reference to the April visit of Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov to the U.S. Facebook is anticipated to receive a record punishment for moving European data to USA servers. The main point of contention is Facebook's transfer of user data from EU citizens to U.S. citizens, which has raised privacy concerns in Europe. According to two unnamed people with knowledge of the situation, the sum imposed by EU authorities would surpass the previous high, which was a 746 million euros, 647 million pounds, charge imposed on Amazon for violating EU privacy laws. On Monday morning, the regulators, led by Ireland's Data Protection Commission, DPC, are anticipated to issue a judgment that will probably demand that Facebook cease utilizing complex legal instruments to transfer EU data to the US. These transatlantic data flows have drawn criticism because they may expose Europeans to the laxer privacy regulations in the US. Facebook threatened to halt its services in Europe last year if its method of data sharing was prohibited. Meta disclosed its first quarter financial figures in late April while indicating that a judgment from the Irish Data Protection Commission was anticipated in May.
The California-based company was fined 390 million euros, 338 million pounds, in January by Ireland's DPC for violating EU privacy laws by making customers consent to personalized advertisements. In addition to paying the punishment, Meta was forbidden from requiring users to subscribe to such adverts. The advertisements target those who are most likely to be interested in the items and services being advertised since they are based on someone's online behavior. Another company owned by Meta, WhatsApp, was previously punished by Ireland's DPC for violating strict rules about the openness of data exchanged with its other businesses. The first victim of the zombie drug in the UK, widespread usage possible throughout the nation. Experts have warned that a new zombie drug has claimed its first victim in the UK and may become widely used there. In May of last year, 43-year-old Carl Warburton became the first known victim of xylazine, a potent sedative that has wreaked havoc on US towns. The term, zombie drug, refers to the tranquilizer xylazine, which veterinarians employ to sedate large animals. When administered, xylazine can result in enormous areas of decaying flesh and dangerously low heart and respiration rates. The father of two, who had been referred to addiction treatment, is believed to have ingested heroin laced with fentanyl and xylazine. The manufacturing worker was discovered in his Solihull, West Midlands, living room. His cause of death was ruled by a coroner to be acute aspiration pneumonitis, lung damage brought on by breathing in toxins, and xylazine was mentioned as a contributory factor. Toxicologists noted a strange peak in the results of his drug test, which led them to chance find the substance in his blood. As drug screens are not made to identify it, scientists have now cautioned that xylazine, sometimes known as trank on the street, may already be present in large quantities in the British heroin supply. According to studies by the Food and Drug Administration (FDA), it is common in 7% of overdoses nationwide and as high as 26% in some places, contributing to an epidemic of drug fatalities in the U.S. The National Program on Substance Abuse Deaths Dr. Caroline Copeland oversaw research at King's College London into Mr. Warburton's passing. She asserted that it was highly likely the substance was present elsewhere on the UK drug market but was going undetected. If it has appeared in one place, it is highly unlikely that this was the only preparation with xylazine available, she said. It probably is elsewhere but isn't being detected. The most immediate thing to be done is to tell heroin users that this is around. Erdogan's challenger, Kamal Kilicdaroglu referred to the election as being the most unjust ever. After a closely contested campaign, Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan declared victory in the presidential election on Sunday, extending his increasingly autocratic reign for a third decade. Erdogan's triumph follows a period of severe inflation and an earthquake that caused entire cities to be destroyed. After the voting was over, Erdogan addressed his supporters in Istanbul while speaking from atop a bus. He thanked them for allowing him to serve as president for another five years. We will continue to be at the forefront of this struggle until real democracy comes to our country, he said in Ankara. He expressed his gratitude to the more than 25 million voters and urged them to remain upright. The outcomes of the election will have an impact outside of Turkey, which is located at the intersection of Europe and Asia and plays a significant role in NATO.
A third term would give Erdogan an even greater hand both domestically and globally. In the world arena, Erdogan's administration blocked Sweden's application to join NATO and bought Russian missile defense systems, which prompted the United States to kick Turkey out of a deal to develop fighter jets under its leadership. But it also assisted in negotiating a vital agreement that let grain supplies from Ukraine and prevented a world food catastrophe. Erdogan's 2017 referendum to abolish Turkey's parliamentary system of government, which he barely won, turned the president from a primarily ceremonial position to a strong position. In 2014, he became the first president to be elected in this manner. In 2018, he won the election that brought about the executive presidency. Erdogan, who has been president of Turkey for 20 years, narrowly lost the first round of elections on May 14. He lost the election handily for the first time, yet he still made progress. But Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, Erdogan's challenger, referred to the election as being the most unjust ever. Kyiv begins offensive actions on the front lines of the Ukraine war while Zelensky mocks hysterical Russia. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says Moscow has reacted, hysterically, to every step we take, in Donetsk. The enemy knows that Ukraine will win, he added. However, Kyiv has refuted Russian accusations that it has launched a significant counteroffensive. Ukrainian forces are shifting to offensive actions in several regions along the front line. In the south of Ukraine's Donetsk area, Moscow claimed to have stopped a significant Ukrainian offensive, killing 250 troops and destroying 16 tanks. Hanna Malir, the deputy defense minister of Ukraine, rejected the allegations and said that they had been contrived to deflect attention from Russian defeat in Bakhmut. She denied claims that Ukrainian soldiers were taking part in a massive operation, saying instead that they were shifting to offensive actions in specific regions along the front line. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky claimed Moscow has responded hysterically to every step we take in Donetsk in a speech hours after visiting the UK Foreign Secretary in Kyiv. He said, first of all, I am grateful to each of our warriors, to all our defenders who gave us the news we expect. Bakhmut direction, well done, warriors. Mr. Zelensky added, the enemy knows that Ukraine will win. They see it. Even though Russia unlawfully occupied Donetsk last year, Moscow only has limited authority over the city. According to Moscow's leaked drone footage, Ukrainian equipment was destroyed. Two weeks after the Wagner organization led the victorious attack on the eastern city following the bloodiest combat of the conflict, the organization claimed that Ukrainian troops have retaken a portion of a village north of Bakhmut. Yevgeny Prigozhin described it as a disgrace and said that Berkivka had been retaken by Kyiv forces. Sergei Shaigu, Russia's defense minister, and Valery Gerasimov, its chief of staff, were among the military figures he pleaded with to join the front lines. On his second trip to Kyiv, UK Foreign Secretary James cleverly met with Mr. Zelensky and the nation's foreign minister, Dmitry Kuliba, earlier on Monday. According to the Foreign, Commonwealth, and Development Office, the two talked about how the UK can continue to help Ukraine in the best possible ways, including through military aid and financial assurances.
The visit coincides with preparations for the Recovery Conference for Ukraine, which will take place in London later in June and focus on improving the country's economy. ANOTERUS regulator is suing Binance, which causes a decline in the value of cryptocurrencies and stock prices. About Binance, a cryptocurrency exchange, U.S. officials have launched a complaint, alleging several infractions, including the misappropriation of investor cash. After the Securities and Exchange Commission SEC, made public 13 allegations against the largest exchange in the world and its creator Changpeng Zhao, cryptocurrency prices and stock prices in firms with a stake in the blockchain and cryptocurrency industries fell. The watchdog alleged they deceived investors about market surveillance procedures, falsely exaggerated trading volumes, misappropriated client funds, neglected to exclude U.S. consumers from its platform, and more. In addition, it claimed that they were covertly in charge of its clients' assets, allowing them to mix and spend investment money any way it pleased. Binance replied by stating that it will vigorously defend our platform. It further stated that since it wasn't a U.S. exchange, the sex authority was, in its opinion, constrained. The value decline was expected considering past price volatility during difficult times. The biggest cryptocurrency in the world, Bitcoin, was down 5.3% reaching its lowest point since mid-March. Cryptocurrency on Binance decreased by 9.4%. Coinbase Global, a competitor crypto exchange, had an 11.6% decline in share price. The U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission filed a lawsuit against Binance and Zhao in March for running an illegal exchange and a sham compliance scheme, according to the regulator. Following a disastrous 2022, a rally for cryptocurrency values has been dampened by the allegations against Binance. Regulators turned their attention to the industry after FTX's collapse in November of last year and the subsequent arrest of its founder, Sam Bankman Fried. The SEC earlier this year handed Coinbase a Wells notice, which often foreshadows impending legal action. The most dependable news sources for today's youngsters are TikTok and Instagram influencers. According to a survey, younger people are turning to Instagram and TikTok users for their news and fact-checking as opposed to journalists and the mainstream media. 55% of TikTok users and 52% of Instagram users, respectively, obtain their news from personalities on the respective platforms, according to a survey done for the Reuters Institute for the Survey of Journalism, a division of the British University of Oxford. According to the 2023 Digital News Report, Barely 33% of users on TikTok and 42% of users on Instagram obtain their news from journalists and conventional media. Nick Newman, a senior research associate at the Reuters Institute, wrote in the report, perhaps the most striking findings in this year's report relate to the changing nature of social media. Partly characterized by declining engagement with traditional networks such as Facebook and the rise of TikTok and a range of other video-led networks. Young people nowadays are more than ever impacted by influencers on the platform for trends, recommendations, and now even news, claims Newman. Our data show, more clearly than ever, how this shift is strongly influenced by habits of the youngest generations, who have grown up with social media and nowadays often pay more attention to influencers or celebrities than they do to journalists, even when it comes to news," he wrote.
On more traditional sites like Facebook and Twitter, where users opted to follow mainstream news sources over individuals for their news, 43 to 38 and 55 to 42, respectively, this trend was not evident. Additionally, TikTok stood out among the other social media platforms, such as YouTube and Snapchat, since a higher percentage of users, 44%, trust ordinary people to provide their news. Other platforms were also below 37%. The 2023 Reuters Institute Digital News Report also discovered that more young people prefer social media over websites or apps for news delivery. In 2018, 32% of young people used websites or apps from mainstream media to get their news online. In 2023, this percentage dropped to a little over 1 in 5, 22% people. On the other hand, from 23% in 2018 to 30% in 2019, more young people are utilizing social media to acquire their news. Comparatively speaking, 52% of those over 35 choose to obtain internet news by going straight to a news website or app. Only 24% of those in the 18 to 24 age group followed suit. According to the report's findings, young people are becoming more and more critical of the news media, which is heavily influenced by politicians and other people. Rasmus Cleese Nielsen, head of the Reuters Institute, stated in a statement that these changes represent a much more fundamental change for digital and TV news channels. Pirelli, Italy prevents Chinese takeover of the giant tire manufacturer. Italy has taken action to prevent a state-owned Chinese corporation from taking over Pirelli, the world's largest tire manufacturer. The choice is a component of the actions the Italian government has announced to safeguard Pirelli's independence. Sinochem, a Beijing-controlled chemical juggernaut that has a 37% stake in the 151-year-old Milan-based company Pirelli, is the largest shareholder. As the U.S. Secretary of State visits China, tensions between Beijing and the West are in the spotlight. Pirelli announced to investors on Sunday that the Italian government had decided that only Campfin, a business owned by Pirelli's CEO Marco Tronchetti Provera, may propose candidates for the position of chief executive. Additionally, Pirelli stated that any modifications to the corporation's corporate governance will be subject to governmental review. It followed Sinochem's March announcement that it would be renewing and updating an existing shareholder agreement. The government of Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney investigated the arrangement by the Golden Power Procedure regulations which are intended to safeguard companies that are thought to be strategically significant to the country. Pirelli was sold to a consortium of investors in 2015 for £6.1 billion or $7.8 billion, including ChemChina and Campin. ChemChina merged with state-owned Sinochem six years later. A further 9% of Pirelli is owned by the Silk Road Investment Fund of the Chinese government. On his penultimate day of a rare trip to China by a senior Washington official, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is in Beijing. The timing of Mr. Blinken's visit coincides with a recent deterioration in ties between China and several Western countries over topics including trade, Taiwan, and security. Before his arrival, authorities believed there was little hope of a resolution to the numerous disagreements between the two largest economies in the world, including Washington's efforts to impede China's computer chip industry's growth. Biden calls on 11 Jinping as a dictator in China. A day after Antony Blinken met with Chinese officials to discuss tensions between the two countries, Biden made his remarks. 
President Biden referred to Chinese President Xi Jinping as a dictator on Tuesday when addressing a fundraiser in California. The American president also mirrored remarks made earlier this year regarding a Chinese spy balloon that floated across the country, saying Xi was ashamed the balloon was blown off track. A day after Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with the Chinese president in China to reduce tensions between the two nations, Reuters claimed that Biden made the comments at a fundraiser in California. Blinken told reporters after his meeting with Xi on Monday that the U.S. and China's relationship had taken a positive step because both sides had recognized the need for stabilization. Over the weekend, Biden expressed his desire to speak with Xi about how Washington and Beijing might get along. Since his arrival on Monday, Biden has had four fundraisers scheduled in California as he prepares for his 2024 candidacy. With a top-secret acoustic system, the U.S. Navy discovered the Titan sub-implosion the day the vessel vanished. Within hours of the Titan submarine entering the water to examine the Titanic disaster, the U.S. Navy discovered what it believed to be an implosion. According to a U.S. defense official, the Titan lost contact with the mothership about an hour and a half into its mission on Sunday morning, and the Navy immediately started searching for it. The official said that sounds associated with either an explosion or an implosion were detected by the Navy's top-secret acoustic monitoring system close to where the Titan was discovered on Thursday. While not definitive, this information was immediately shared with the incident commander to assist with the ongoing search and rescue mission, the official said in a statement. The announcement came after the U.S. Coast Guard determined that the missing Titan submarine was among the debris field that had been discovered earlier in the day. Rear Admiral John Mauger of the U.S. Coast Guard told journalists that the debris was consistent with the catastrophic loss of the pressure chamber. On behalf of the U.S. Coast Guard and the entire Unified Command, I offer my deepest condolences to the families," he said. Around 1 hour and 45 minutes into its dive on Sunday morning, the Titan lost contact with its surface ship, the Polar Prince. This happened around 900 miles east of Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and about 400 miles southeast of St. John's, in Canada's Newfoundland. The Ocean Gate CEO Stockton Rush, the British businessman turned adventurer Hamish Harding, the wealthy father and son duo Shazada and Suleiman Dawood, and Paul Henry Nargillette, a major authority on the Titanic, were all aboard the ship. James Cameron finally speaks out about the submarine accident in Titanic. After the devastatingly unsuccessful search for the missing Ocean Gate Titan submarine on Thursday, Titanic, filmmaker James Cameron has spoken out. Cameron thought the Titanic disaster in 1912 and the terrible tale of the sub were disturbingly similar. Well, I've been down there many times, Cameron told on Thursday. I've made 33 dives and I've actually calculated that I've spent more time on the ship than the captain did back in the day. According to the filmmaker, who also happens to be a submersible designer, Cameron even built a sub that could reach the deepest sections of the ocean, which are three times deeper than the position of the Titanic. In March 2012, he traveled to the Mariana Trench in the Deep Sea Challenger, a 24-foot submersible. Cameron noted that, 
Many people in the community were very concerned about this sub. He said. A number of the top players in the community even wrote letters to the company saying that what they were doing was too experimental to carry passengers. I'm struck by the similarity of the Titanic disaster itself, where the captain was repeatedly warned about ice ahead of his ship and yet he steamed at full speed into an ice field on a moonless night and many people died as a result. And for a very similar tragedy, where warnings went unheeded, to take place at the same exact site, with all the diving that's going on all around the world, I think is just astonishing. It's really quite surreal," he concluded. The missing Titanic tourist submersible, which was carrying five people, has been identified as a debris field, the U.S. Coast Guard said on Thursday. All five people on board are thought to be dead. Inside the vessel were Ocean Gate's CEO Stockton Rush. British businessman turned adventurer Hamish Harding, father and son Shahzada and Suleiman Dawood, who are members of one of Pakistan's wealthiest families. And Paul Henry Narjolet, a former French Navy officer and leading Titanic expert. These men were true explorers who shared a distinct spirit of adventure and a deep passion for exploring and protecting the world's oceans, OceanGate said in a statement. Our hearts are with these five souls and every member of their families during this tragic time. Titanic, 25 years later, a National Geographic documentary, was released by Cameron in February. The contentious hypothesis that Jack, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, may have survived by scaling Rose's door in the middle of the icy waters, was discussed in the documentary. To avoid bloodshed, Wagner's chief directs soldiers to return from Moscow. Through a social media post, Yevgeny Prigozhin declared that his soldiers are turning our columns around to avoid bloodshed. According to reports, Alexander Lukashenko, the president of Belarus, acknowledged that he had begun talks with Prigozhin on Vladimir Putin's behalf and with his approval. The discussions went on all day long. Prigozhin consented to halt his company's progress toward Moscow. At the moment, an absolutely profitable and acceptable option for solving the situation is on the table with security guarantees for the Wagner PMC fighters, a statement from the Belarusian government claimed. The announcement from Prigozhin appears to put an end to what many described as Putin's regime's biggest threat in his 23 years in power. According to the Associated Press, Prigozhin remained silent on the response of Moscow to his desire to remove Sergei Shaigu as defense minister. The Kremlin did not respond right away. When they were more than halfway to Moscow, 30 miles, 50 kilometers beyond Voronezh, a helicopter opened fire on the troop carriers, two flatbed trucks, and each tank. Prigozhin said that he had entered Rostov-on-Don without firing a shot and taken control of the southern military district of Russia's headquarters. For Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the city has acted as the primary logistics center. After aborted Wagner mutiny, China maintains support for Russia. Despite the Wagner gang of heavily armed mercenaries staging a brief rebellion on Saturday, China is still backing Russia. After more than two decades in office, Vladimir Putin faced one of his largest challenges from that. Following the failed insurrection, Andrei Rodenko, the deputy foreign minister of Russia, met with Chinese officials on Sunday to address international matters.
According to the ministry, China expressed support for Russia's leadership to maintain country stability following Saturday's events. Andrei Rodenko, the deputy foreign minister of Russia, and Qin Gang, the foreign minister of China, conducted discussions about Sino-Russian ties and international and regional issues of common concern. Later, it was said that China supports Russia in preserving its sense of national stability and that the recent rise in tensions in Russia was due to internal affairs in that country. Unknown was Rodenko's exact arrival time in Beijing as well as if his trip to China, a significant Russian ally, was in response to the ostensible uprising headed by mercenary commander Yevgeny Prigozhin. In exchange for withdrawing his soldiers back to base and going to Belarus, Prigozhin was saved from criminal prosecution, and the mutiny ended on Saturday. While the insurrection was taking place, Chinese leaders kept a conspicuous silence. However, the state-run Global Times in China claimed on Saturday that by exaggerating Prigozhin's mutiny and creating an illusion, Russia is concealing several internal inconsistencies. Furthermore, the most recent attack on Russian social cohesion was the claim that the building is collapsing, which was made by Western media. On social media, Putin received a lot of support from Chinese folks. The area around Moscow is peaceful. The Chinese embassy in Russia said on Saturday to the Chinese media source Southern Metropolis Daily. Western officials, like American President Joe Biden, indicated they were closely following the situation in the meanwhile. Prigozhin claimed that the goal of his march on Moscow was to depose the dishonest and inept leaders who he holds responsible for the failure of the Ukrainian conflict. The military command in Rostov-on-Don, a metropolis of more than a million people, was taken over by Wagner forces on Saturday. They then marched swiftly hundreds of kilometers north toward their capital without encountering any significant opposition. The Kremlin appeared helpless for many anxious hours as Wagner convoys passed into Russia destroying sporadic barriers and shooting down military planes dispatched to stop them. Hours later, however, the Russian president pardoned Prigozhin on the condition that he enter exile in Belarus. While the Kremlin attempted to portray the agreement as a clever maneuver that prevented an impending slaughter. It was a surprising concession for a guy who has consistently repressed any indication of dissent and occasionally used violence to muzzle opponents who dare to oppose him. Expert. Prigozhin's move to Belarus might be a strategic one by Putin and could endanger NATO countries. Yevgeny Prigozhin, the chief of the Wagner Group, may have relocated to Belarus as part of a larger plan by Russian President Vladimir Putin to weaken Ukrainian defenses. It is a strategic move to beef up Russian force posture and open a second front for Western Ukraine war, said author and former DIA intelligence officer Rebecca Koffler. Koffler said her intelligence analysis has her leaning to believe, the revolt was not authentic. My intel analysis suggests the coup attempt was false flag operation, said Koffler. It is a strategic move to beef up Russian force posture and open a second front for Western Ukraine war. The president of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko, acknowledged on Tuesday that Prigozhin had arrived in his nation after launching a coup in Russia the previous weekend. Koffler's remarks coincide with that announcement. 
The head of the Wagner Group is apparently in Belarus as part of an agreement made with the Kremlin to go there in exile in return for immunity from prosecution, but his presence there puts NATO neighbors on edge. We are closely monitoring the situation and are fully prepared to react should the situation require, a Lithuanian official told regarding Prigozhin's move to Belarus. Koffler asserts that nations like Poland and Lithuania, which border Belarus to the west and north, respectively, are entitled to have their suspicions about the move and are probably already debating how to strengthen security. The day before Prigozhin arrived in Belarus, he made a speech outlining his justification for the brief rebellion, claiming that the invasion of Russian cities and the hasty march on Moscow were an effort to show the worth of his soldiers. The Wagner Group leader did not acknowledge any deal with Putin to end the uprising, instead saying that he stood down in an attempt to prevent any Russian bloodshed. However, Koffler said that, Prigozhin cannot be trusted any more than Putin, arguing the Wagner Group leader is only honest about his work on behalf of Mother Russia. And Mother Russia is now Putin. Putin also aims to hold at risk NATO's eastern flank. It is why he recently gifted tactical nuclear weapons to Alexander Lukashenko, the president of Belarus, Koffler said in response to the speech. Koffler thinks Prigozhin's presence in Belarus will set in action a far bigger scheme. A handbag that is, smaller than a grain of salt, sells for more than $63,000. A tiny handbag that was just 657 by 222 by 700 microns or less than 0.03 inches wide, sold for more than $63,000 on Wednesday at an online auction. The neon yellowish green bag, which is hardly perceptible to the human eye, is based on a well-known Louis Vuitton design, however, it was created by a New York art collective rather than the premium brand itself. The Brooklyn-based organization Mischief calls their minuscule design the microscopic handbag and boasts that it is smaller than a grain of sea salt. Two-photon polymerization, a production technique used to 3D print tiny plastic components, was employed to create the item. It was offered for sale with a microscope that has a viewing window for the bag that has a digital display. More of the design can be seen in a promotional image, which also reveals Louis Vuitton's recognizable LV monogram. The bag looks to be modeled on the French brand's On The Go tote, which sells for between $3,100 and $4,300 in full size right now. Pharrell Williams, an American singer, record producer, and designer, created Jupiter, an online auction company, which was in charge of hosting the sale. Kevin Wiesner, the chief creative officer of Mischief, previously told the New York Times that the collective had not asked for permission to use the French label's logo or design. Pharrell loves big hats, so we made him an incredibly small bag, he told the newspaper. Founded in 2016, Mischief has gained notoriety for its drops which are satirical art initiatives that frequently parody consumer capitalism while making money off of it. Infamously, Nike sued the group over its Satan Shoes, a line of 666 modified Nike shoes that included satanic emblems and actual human blood droplets. Ultimately, a settlement was reached outside of court. The group, well known for mocking the excesses of the art world, has now switched its focus to high-end fashion. Examples include selling fake Andy Warhol drawings or tearing apart Damien Hirst's artworks. The firm created the Birkenstocks, 
sandals in 2021 after tearing up four Birkin purses, which it sold for high to $76,000 a pair. More recently, after being spotted on celebrities like Doja Cat, Iggy Azalea, and Janelle Monet, the big red boots, a pair of cartoonish rubber boots, became viral. The fashion industry's obsession with little bags, according to a statement issued with the auction listing, has resulted in their becoming steadily more abstracted, to the point where the item is now purely a brand signifier. Previous small leather handbags have still required a hand to carry them. They become dysfunctional, inconveniences to their wearer, the statement added. Microscopic handbag takes this to its full logical conclusion. A practical object is boiled down into jewelry. All of its putative function evaporated. For luxury objects, usability is the angel's share. Mexico. Mayor marries alligator-like reptile WHO he calls Princess Girl. A Mexican mayor wed an animal that resembles an alligator in a customary ritual that is meant to bring luck to his people. Victor Hugo Sosa married Alicia Adriana, a Cayman reptile while acting out an ancient ceremony. The creature is referred to as the princess girl in local history or custom, and the mayor claimed that the two loved each other. In San Pedro Huamalula, a village of indigenous Chantal people in the southern Mexican state of Oaxaca, onlookers cheered and danced as two persons exchanged holy vows. Mr. Sosa said during the ritual, I accept responsibility because we love each other. That is what is important. He was seen giving the animal a head kiss. You can't have a marriage without love. I yield to marriage with a princess girl. There has been a Cayman marriage ceremony between a man and a woman for 230 years to mark the end of hostilities between the indigenous Chantal and Wave peoples. To unite the two towns, the mayor, who is a metaphor for the Chantal monarch, marries the reptile, who is a representation of a Wave princess girl. Caymans are indigenous to Mexico and Central America and dwell in wetlands. The animal is taken from home to house before the ritual so that villagers can dance and hold her. The reptile is dressed in a green skirt, a vibrant hand-embroidered tunic, and a ribbon and sequin hat. Her mouth is tied shut to prevent any untoward incidents before the wedding. Later, she is given a white bride's outfit and brought to the town hall for the wedding. After the event, the mayor danced with his bride to the sounds of traditional music. The largest cruise ship in the world is almost ready. A ship that is expected to be the largest cruise ship in the world has finished construction at a Finnish shipyard and made its maiden journey into open water for sea trials before it is slated to be delivered in October of this year. Icon of the Seas, a massive cruise ship from Royal Caribbean International, will measure 365 meters long or almost 1,200 feet and weigh an estimated 250,800 tons. In January 2024, it will cruise into Caribbean waters with a capacity of 5,610 passengers and 2,350 staff members. The largest water park at sea in the world will be the boat's showpiece. The vessel, Category 6, will include six water slides that will set records, but those who want a more sedate experience can unwind in one of the vessel's seven pools or nine whirlpools. It is being constructed in Turku, Finland, at Meyer Turku Shipyard, one of the top shipyards in Europe. Before its 2024 debut, 
Royal Caribbean International President and Chief Executive Michael Bailey informed the public at an on-site news conference earlier this year that the ship was scheduled to join the company's fleet on October 26. Another ship in the Royal Caribbean line, Wonder of the Seas, which took its first voyage only last year and is a somewhat shorter 1,188 feet long with just 18 decks to explore, now holds the title of most giant cruise ship in the world. We are positioning it as the ultimate family vacation and when you step back and look at all the energy and time that has gone into creating this ship, it is mind-blowing," Bailey said. The icon completed its first set of sea trials on June 22, according to a Royal Caribbean statement. During her first set of sea trials, Icon of the Seas traveled hundreds of miles, during which the main engines, hull, brake systems, steering, noise, and vibration levels were all tested, the statement said. More than 40 dining, drinking, and entertainment options are advertised by the ship many of which are included in the cruise cost. The concept is to appeal to every sort of vacationer, with everything from locations for young children to adults only spots like Royal Caribbean International's first dueling pianos bar. There are 20 decks and 8 districts to explore. There are 28 distinct varieties of lodging, with more options for families, more designs with views of the ocean, and more room for groups. According to the cruise line, this is the most time ever devoted to designing the ideal home base. As part of the company's transition to a clean energy future, Icon of the Seas is also Royal Caribbean International's first ship propelled by liquefied natural gas, LNG, and fuel cell technology. On Icon of the Seas, over 2,600 employees have been hard at work every day. During the four-day sea testing, there were hundreds of experts on board to evaluate performance. A second round of sea testing, according to Royal Caribbean, is planned for later in 2023. All year long, Icon of the Seas departs from Miami on seven-night cruises to the Eastern and Western Caribbean. Every sailing will include a visit to Perfect Day at Coco Cay, Royal Caribbean's award-winning private island destination, as well as its new expansion, Hideaway Beach. Report. Experts believe climate change is boosting the incidence of kidney stones in young children. The increase in kidney stone instances among children and teenagers is thought to be caused by climate change as well as other reasons, according to experts. According to experts, kidney stones used to primarily affect middle-aged white males, but they are now increasingly affecting youngsters and teenagers, especially during the summer. According to the Clinical Journal of the American Society of Nephrology, the number of kidney stone cases per year increased by 16 percent between 1997 and 2012, with 15 to 19-year-olds experiencing the most significant increase in instances. According to NBC News, males start to become more prone to the condition around 25 years old, while girls in this age group have a 52 percent greater incidence of kidney stone events. According to the study, kidney stones in children increased from 1997 to 2012, and black children and adults experienced kidney stones more frequently than their white counterparts. When urine is overly concentrated, minerals like calcium and uric acid salts crystallize and cause kidney stones to form. Stones can develop as a result of dehydration and cause pain if they become trapped in the urinary tract. Although doctors are unsure of the exact cause of this rise in young people, they have hypothesized that dehydration in kids is being brought on by climate change, 
a diet high in ultra-processed foods, and an increase in the usage of antibiotics. According to Dr. Gregory Tajian, a pediatric urologist at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, my research group has focused on the relationship between temperature and kidney stone presentations for 10 years. Tajian told NBC News that whereas kidney stones in adults are frequently associated with diseases like obesity, hypertension, and diabetes, this is not the case with children. In children, we're not seeing that, Tajian told the outlet. They're otherwise healthy and simply come in with their first kidney stone for unclear reasons. Kidney stones in children are most common during the summer, according to doctors, and to help hospitals across the nation keep up with the rise in cases, stone clinics have been established. Clearly something has changed in our environment that is causing this rapid shift, Tajian said. In an effort to compete with CHATGPT, Elon Musk launches a long-awaited AI startup. The owner of Twitter has hired a group of engineers from other digital companies to compete with them in the field of artificial intelligence. Musk has warned about the civilizational destruction that AI may cause for months. He contends that the race to create the technology by businesses like Google and Microsoft should be put on hold to give time to develop rules for the technology. Musk, who also co-founded OpenAI but later left the startup credited with igniting the generative AI frenzy, stated that the goal of the launch of XAI is to understand the true nature of the universe. The Center for AI Safety, a nonprofit organization that works to lessen the hazards associated with the technology, is led by Dan Hendricks, who will also act as an advisor to the new business. Several former engineers and scientists from Alphabet-owned Google, Microsoft, and OpenAI are on the startup staff. We have worked on and led the development of some of the largest breakthroughs in the field including AlphaStar, GPT 3.5, and GPT 4, the startup said on its website. The business will host a Twitter Spaces event on July 14 to recruit skilled engineers and researchers to work as technical employees in the Bay Area. According to the website, Musk's startup would collaborate closely with his other businesses, such as Twitter and Tesla. Investors were unconcerned that the startup will be a possible distraction for Musk, as evidenced by the lack of reaction Tesla shares made to the announcement, which was trading 1.5% higher. According to a state document, the billionaire filed a business called XI Corp which was formed in Nevada, in March. Musk is listed as the company's only director while Jared Burkle, the family office's managing director, is listed as the secretary. In April, the Financial Times claimed that Musk has obtained for the undertaking thousands of powerful GPU processors from NVIDIA, 